Education Director for the DPC Ed Center, and I'd like to welcome you to our June patient webinar on plant-based diets and kidney disease. As a reminder, all our lines are muted, uh, but throughout the webinar, you can type questions in the chat box, and they'll be answered at the end of the program. Within a week, we should have the webinar recording and slides posted on our website, and we encourage you to complete the brief feedback form at the end of the, the program to share your opinion, your suggestions. Um, we use those when we're looking um, for topics for additional webinars for this year, next year, as well as we also look at the topics that you want and use some of your suggestions as well for our newsletters. So it's important to us to get, to get your feedback of, of what's important and what's needed. So please take just a couple of minutes if you can and, and share that with us at the end of the program. Today our presenter is Jessiana Seville. Um, I've known Jessiana probably almost since when I started with the agency. Um, she's a registered dietitian who works with dietitians as well as patients who are at various stages of kidney disease. She is such an advocate for patients and for nutrition as a treatment for, for preserving kidney function. And she empowers patients um, through nutri nutritional guidance, um, through her webinars, and through interactions, um, both online and by phone. She um, has her own practice that she works with them. And she's the founder of the Kidney RD. And she's been helping and working with kidney patients for a, a number of years. And you can see on her slide, she also welcomes um, followers. So you can also um, keep up with her on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and, and Pinterest. She's also a member of our um, advisory council and has offered tremendous suggestions and has written articles for us and past webinars, so you can also go back to our archives and see some of her articles in the newsletter, as well as some of her past uh, presentations and, and webinars in YouTube. So at this point, I'd like to pr turn over the pro program to Jessiana, and I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Kathy. It's wonderful to be here. It's always a, a treat for me when I get to come do a presentation. Um, I love, love talking about this. I love doing presentations. And this is a really, really interesting topic to talk about plant-based diets, especially from the reference of dialysis. Um, so it's, you know, just really a treat to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. All right, now I've got to make sure. Ah, here we go. Okay. Okay. So I want to talk just, just to give a little bit of introduction on plant based diets. So plant-based diets, which are, you know, they come in a lot of different words, vegan, <laughs> plant focused, you know, there's a lot of different ways. Plant there's a lot of political buzz around plant-based diets. Some people have completely cut animal products out of their their life for ethical reasons, some people for health reasons, but you know, it gets, you know, both humor and flack on the internet for a variety of reasons. And I put up just a couple little um, just a couple little uh, comics that I found online to exhibit this point because I feel like there is, you know, there is a lot of misconception and, you know, <laughs> so there, there's a lot of joking that goes around plant-based diets, but it's really something to be taken seriously. And there's a reason that there's a lot of buzz around it. Some people have definitely found a huge amount of health benefits. Um, from plant-based diets and, you know, as people are, you know, thinking about their health, considering how they can up-level their health, be healthier and happier, um, uh, we just wanted to clarify some misconceptions that especially surround using plant-based diets in dialysis. Now, we use them a lot with people that are not on dialysis in CKD, uh, but I worked in dialysis for many, many years, and I can see where there could be pushback from either clinicians or patients 
Um, but, you know, there really are some ways that you can adopt it. And I can say anecdotally uh, from, you know, my fellow dietitians that have patients following plant-based diets that those people really find a lot of success if they're able to implement it correctly. So let's just back this up a little bit because there's a whole bunch of levels of plant-based, right? What is a plant-based diet? On this, you know, this big side here, we have an omnivore diet, which is what most people eat. So, you know, it's meat and grains and vegetables and, you know, all the different foods in there. Then we have pesco-vegetarian, which is basically someone who includes fish, but they don't include, you know, chicken or any of the other ones, um, uh, chicken or dairy or eggs or beef. Um, their only uh, animal protein source is fish. And then we have ovo-lacto-vegetarians. When someone says they're vegetarians, often vegetarian, oftentimes this is what they mean, where they include dairy products. Um, and other than that, they don't eat any meat or animal protein, uh, usually, some, usually some eggs and some dairy products. And then we have full vegan, which means there are zero animal products. Um, there's no meat. There's no fish. There's no dairy products. It's all uh, it's all plants. So a um, lot of different levels there. When we talk about a plant-based diet, we are primarily talking about a vegan diet. The reason that we use two different words here is that uh, vegan often is associated with just no meat, where plant-based is associated with focusing on getting a lot of plants. You can have a, uh, a vegan diet where you have, you know, oatmeal in the morning, and french fries with chili at lunch and, you know, for dinner, maybe a garden vegetable burger. And while there is zero meat in that day, it's not necessarily really, really heavily plant-based with a lot of produce in it. So what do you actually eat? If you're eating a plant-based diet, what does that look like? I want to flesh this out so we can talk about a few things and where some of the misconceptions are. The real big, I, you know, I still, I know food pyramids are a thing of the past, but I still think like it, it gives a really good perception of quantities of food that are included. So a good plant-based diet has a lot of produce in it, peppers and pineapples and squashes and, um, you know, plums and tomatoes and, you know, a lot, a lot of different produce. And we're going to talk about potassium in a minute because this is one of the first things people get hung up on with a plant-based diet is the potassium. So we have, you know, fruits and vegetables, and that can be a big, big, that is the staple in a plant-based diet. Then you have grains. And, you know, grains are beyond corn, oats, and rice, and wheat. Um, a really good plant-based diet uses a huge variety of different grains. Um, and, you know, exploring those different ones gives you a lot, a lot of opportunity to add in a variety of nutrients. Grains are actually one of the protein sources in a plant-based diet. They're also, you know, a, a carbohydrate source, but grains have quite a bit of protein in them as well, so that ends up being an a important part of the protein picture here. Then we have, you know, beans and seeds and nuts. That ends up being a, a giant part of the diet when we go through where holes can happen in the diet. This is one place where people are not conscientiously including beans and nuts and seeds, uh, a variety of them that they can really get some big holes in their diet. So that's something that we like to include. A lot of people will use fortified dairy substitutes, um, almond milk and oat milk. And, you know, there's a very, there's a lot of plant-based products on the market and a lot of really good ones too. Um, the big concern there is looking for phosphate additives. And then at the top, this is where there can be some controversy, is whether you use oil or no oil. Um, and then for all of us, we should be reducing the amount of sugars in our diet. So whether that's honey or sugar or, you know, whatever, that's a part that we would use just in very small amounts. So what does a day actually look like? I, I was telling uh, Hannah and Kathy before I got on that I wanted to put a good meal plan up here. We, we sell a plant-based meal plan on our website at community.com, but the picture would not come on here clearly. So I was like, oh, I'll just take part of it. So what could this look like? One thing is I go through this, 
And yes, ma'am. Um, I'm not sure if other people are having difficulty seeing your slides. Are, are you advancing them? I am advancing them, but it says okay. uh, slide 6 of 17 stopped. So I don't know what that means. Okay. So maybe, oh, wait a second. I see. Did it just switch now? Oh, 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 oh. Okay, hold on. It may just be Hannah and my slides. Um, Hannah could let me retouch the slides. Um, Yes, if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to just, if I could just ask you to pause very quickly, I'm going to try and reset the slides and see if it fixes it. Okay, that sounds good. Okay. Yeah, if I press play, then they automatically advance. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, we don't, want, we don't want them to, to do that. Um, the automatic advancement doesn't really work on this, so you have to do the, okay. the manual. Um, squares down at the bottom. So let me just try and reset the slides really quickly, um, and then I think we'll be ready to go. Uh, okay. Yeah. Let me let me know. I'm, there's two. I might have been pressing the wrong place where you're seeing the slides at. Okay. Just one moment. Thank you for doing that. Pictures are everything here. The visual part of food is huge, so we definitely want to get this right. Thank you for your patience. Okay, I think we are back up and running. And Jess, if you just want to Let me use, just, um, is that working? Yes. There we go. <laughs> okay. Okay, perfect. I'm going to just back up a little bit. I've already talked, but I'll just go through a recap since I'm not sure you guys saw the slide. <laughs> so this part is where we were talking. There's, we only missed a couple slides, so I'm glad you caught that early. Um, just talking about how there's a lot of, you know, political and cultural backlash against plant-based or vegan diets. There is also a lot of positive culture and political news as well, but it has really become more than just a diet. And I just wanted to, you know, if you look up vegan comics in Google and click on the images, there's a ton of them out there. Some of them are not very nice, to be really honest. Um, I was, you know, pretty surprised. And others of them were, you know, really, really good. So uh, plant-based diet, again, we talked to different levels. We are primarily going to talk about what a really smart vegan, a very produce-heavy plant-based diet would look like for a dialysis patient. And then what do you actually eat? This is where we talked about, you know, honestly, the fruits and vegetables are the basis of this diet. You have to think about it from this direction. This is really, really critical. Um, moving on to, you know, all the different foods that you include, grains and nuts and beans and seeds and some fortified dairy products. Okay, so this is where we were at. Let's talk a little bit about what a day would look like. What I want you to notice on this is how much of this 
truly is a lot of familiar food for people. Uh, sometimes when people think about plant-based diets, they are, you know, it seems so big and so foreign to what they're actually eating, but honestly, you can make a few small switches and have a really nourishing, healthy diet. So for example, an overnight oats oftentimes will have our patients include some apples or berries in there and nuts as well, but some sort of a uh, grain in the morning is pretty common, uh, both culturally and, and just with our patients. Uh, for snack, people can do usually a fruit and a nut or a vegetable and a dip like hummus and some vegetables are really good. We try and get a, a good fat and a good protein in with a snack uh, every single time if we can. And, you know, a lot of those good proteins end up being nuts or some sort of, of a bean type dip. For lunch, salads are common or soups are common. Your protein source ends up being nuts or beans in there. Uh, as you learn to cook some of the other, you know, soy products, whether it's tofu or tempeh, those can be really, really useful as well as a protein source with your, with your salad or, you know, putting in a wrap. A lot of people like to do hummus wraps as part of their vegan diet. And then dinner, uh, a cashew stir fry over rice, maybe having some mandarin oranges, a little bit of pineapple with it, that's something else that could be done as well. So this is a very, very simple, just wanted to show you an example of what this would look like. You know, I, I tell people often when we think about plant-based diets, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich is totally vegan, and it's something that we all know, and you side that with like a big serving of vegetables, some peppers or carrots or snap peas, and maybe a little at a piece of fruit, you have actually a really, really good meal. So let's talk about some of the concerns for dialysis patients when it comes to plant-based diets, and maybe I can clarify some myths. Number one is potassium. You saw that pyramid very heavy on the produce, and a lot of times when people think about produce, they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. like I can't be doing tomatoes and avocados and all those things. It's going to throw my potassium through the roof. There is, uh, or beans, you know, that's another one. People say, ah, beans have too much potassium. I can't do them. So one of the big questions to answer there then is not does produce have potassium, because of course it does, so there's lots of low potassium options, but does decreasing min meat intake and increasing plant intake actually mean you're going to have higher potassium intake and thus higher potassium levels, because surprisingly, meat actually has quite a bit of potassium. So that's the myth that I want to clarify. The other thing that's really important here is that there's a lot of things that impact potassium other than just food. For example, constipation can really raise people's potassium levels. So, you know, if you move towards a plant-based diet, include a lot of fiber and you're not constipated anymore, potentially uh, potassium would not really be a huge issue for you. So let's just talk about potassium in general. This is a meat versus a plant protein potassium comparison. Um, so chicken for three ounces has 332 milligrams of potassium. A half a cup of chickpeas has 207. These are both common portion sizes. Now chickpeas would have a little bit less protein than chicken, um, but there's a lot of ways that, you know, you can make that more robust. Same with hamburger, three ounces of 243 black beans, which are used often as 334. So, you know, on either of these, it's not more than 100 and 150 milligram difference, but um, they're, you know, they're, they're close, right? They're close and not necessarily can you say plant foods are higher or lower than animal proteins. Uh, pork alone, three ounces, 358 milligrams versus a half a cup of lentils is 365. So again, you can see that there are a lot that they're very, very close. So to answer the first question, if you pull meat out of your diet and replace it with beans or nuts or these other, you know, plant sources, are you really going to throw up your potassium, throw it up high versus what you were previously eating? And the answer is not necessarily, just based on a nutrient basis there of, you know, replacing your meat with a plant uh, protein, you don't have a enormous difference in potassium intake. 
this is a meal comparison, you know, because it's one thing to isolate chicken versus, you know, chickpeas or beans versus black beans, but looking at an overall meal is also really, really helpful. So this meal, and I took this, this meal plan actually from um, a kidney school. They have meal plans in there, and so that I know is distributed frequently in Dallas's unit. And I just wanted to show you what it actually looks like, right? So in that meal plan, they had a meal where they had pork chops and brown rice and steamed broccoli, um, some margarine, which I'm assuming they put on the broccoli, and some apricots, some canned apricots. And that meal rolls in at around 800 milligrams of potassium. So which is, you know, about right. People have, you know, anywhere between 500 to 1,000 milligrams of potassium per meal, um, 30 grams of protein, 45 grams of carbohydrates, 6 grams of fiber, um, 360 milligrams of phosphorus and two grams of iron, around 400 calories for that meal. So a comparison plant-based meal would be, you know, about three ounces of stir-fried tempeh. If you've never tried tempeh, it's actually really, really nice if you stir-fry it with some really good um, spices. It's really delicious. Um, maybe you're stir-frying it with onions. You put some cauliflower and broccoli on the side and maybe have a dinner roll with some vegan margarine. Um, as well, and then some watermelon. So all of that food, quite a bit of food, if you envision both of these places, a lot of food, it actually rolls in with less calories, 377 calories, 872 milligrams of potassium, so it's only 70 milligrams. All of that produce, it's only 70 milligrams of potassium more than the animal-based meal. 21 grams of protein, so it's a, a little bit lower in protein, 30 grams of carbohydrates, 5 grams of fiber. Surprisingly, it's actually a little bit lower in fiber. Um, uh, 313 milligrams of phosphorus, all of that phosphorus, which you wouldn't absorb well, and around 3 grams of iron. When I share this slide, what I really like people to see is that some of the differences are not as big as we think they are. When you're moving towards a plant-based diet, you really – eats, you know, a good robust amount of food and you get a lot of variety of nutrients. What some of these numbers don't tell you at the bottom as far as, you know, how much protein, how much carbohydrate, et cetera, um, is they don't tell you the quality of the food here. I mean, there's so many nutrients beyond just potassium and phosphorus and iron and fiber that are really critical for our body. And the more produce you include, the more variety uh, of nutrients that you can really get into your, into your life and into your diet. So then let's talk about this concern number two, which is phosphorus. Um, I, I feel like in the nephrology community, a lot of the myths surrounding you can't have bees, you can't have nuts have really dissipated, um, that people have accepted that beans and nuts, they have a lot of fiber and so you're not going to absorb a lot of uh, the phosphorus in them, only about 60% versus, you know, upwards of 80 to 90% in animal proteins or 100% in uh, chemical phosphates we find in our food. But I still wanted to point out why actually a plant-based diet can be pretty advantageous if you're struggling with your phosphorus levels, even if you're including nuts and beans and all these things that maybe at some point you were told you couldn't have. So let's just look at this again. Meat actually is very rich in phosphorus. Uh, chicken, 219 milligrams of phosphorus and, you know, pretty well absorbed by it versus, again, chickpeas, 139 milligrams and a half a cup. Uh, about 48% of that you're not going to even absorb. You know, again, a hamburger, 153 milligrams versus black beans, 248 milligrams. Um, it ends up almost being exactly the same as you count the absorption rate. Uh, pork loins, lentils, again, you can see 212 versus 178, and salmon versus edamame. Uh, pretty close in the amount of phosphorus. It's a big myth that just because protein and meat is really pushed in dialysis, that, it's, uh, that it doesn't have any other nutrients that can impact your levels, especially phosphorus and potassium, very, very rich in phosphorus. So you absolutely could switch to more plant-based meals. Even if you're not totally cutting out all the meat, even if you're switching to more plant-based meals, you can do that really safely without it making your potassium and phosphorus go up really high because the nutrient composition is fairly 
similar. Some of the phosphorus concerns that we do see come up, and I wanted to note some of these because uh, it could look confusing at first. The first thing is about nuts. Now, nuts, as you know, are totally okay. I have referenced them many times throughout here, and we look at some nutrients you need to include. I'm going to talk about nuts. What I used to see happen sometimes, and this could happen with any food, but, you know, you don't need a lot of nuts to get a lot of nutrients, but people can sometimes eat nuts like popcorn, and they are going through nuts like crazy, and just on sheer quantity, you know, people can eat a cup or a cup of half nuts and not even, not even blink twice, um, it can really throw up phosphorus. So while you can include nuts and enjoy them, and, you know, sometimes it depends on what you're replacing with, um, if you have excessive portions of them, it still can, you know, put your phosphorus up a little bit. Bran is the other one that I tend to kind of not 100% steer away with, but I have seen sometimes that people will put their phosphorus levels up if they have excessive amounts of bran. Um, sometimes you just switch to a whole grain as well. Beer, um, and then the really big one, sorry I didn't get a bullet point here, is the processed plant-based foods. Uh, the things like garden, and I put it on there, um, or, you know, the plant-based chicken nuggets or, you know, beyond beef. Some of those products, number one, they're very processed. They can have a good amount of sodium. Number two, they have a lot of ingredients that you probably, they're not considered really a whole food, but a lot of them can have phosphate additives. And so if you're switching to a plant-based diet and switching out your chicken for just a, a vegan chicken, um, or a processed vegan chicken, you're not necessarily going to reap the same benefits as you would switching towards the whole food plant-based diet. Certainly some of those foods can be useful for some people, uh, but I know for our patients, we really strongly encourage them to not use the processed vegan products um, as much as possible. So I'm not a fan of them. The yogurt and the milks are, you have to really watch them in particular, especially the yogurts. I've found plant-based yogurts often have phosphate additives in them. So a couple other questions here. Will a plant-based diet lead to malnutrition? Will a plant-based diet lead to malnutrition is a big question. Here is what you have to understand. So if you have Suboptimal nutritional intake, meaning you're not getting a ton of variety of fruits and vegetables in your diet, or not, and not just meat, right, not just protein, but if you overall have suboptimal nutrient intake, you can get protein malnutrition. Protein malnutrition is not just about protein. Um, there are some things that can really contribute to suboptimal nutritional intake, meaning you're just not eating enough of all the nutrients overall. Uh, metabolic acidosis, uh, gut issues. So when it says bowel flora alteration, it's a fancy issue of saying, you know, gut issues, your gut's not well nourished, um, and hormone dysregulation. All of those things can lead to not eating enough of the right amount of food. Um, in a plant-based diet, what ends up happening is that a lot of these things correct. Metabolic acidosis can correct with a really good plant-based diet, because the diet is so alkaline, it has tons of fruits and vegetables. Um, so if you're taking sodium bicarbonate or, you know, your, your doctor has talked with you at all about metabolic acidosis, a plant-based diet, or at least a more plant-forward diet, including a lot more fruits and vegetables, in the research it has shown to be very, very effective for this. Um, with all the different fibers and different types of fibers, a plant-based diet is really, really helpful. Um, and then, you know, the hormone dysregulation as well, that's something that we've seen in the research that plant-based diets can help out with quite a bit. So a couple of things here that I want to go through as far as potential risk. Now, one of the things, ah, oh, and my picture is kind of off on here. I apologize for that. Or maybe it's just on my little slide here. When you are looking at uh, nutrients, right, that can be impacted, one of the things I wanted to talk about is people that shouldn't be on a plant-based diet. It's hard to generalize that as a whole 
Um, everyone just biochemically is very different. Genetically, we're all different. Some people, you know, they're not going, if they're on a fully plant-based diet, they're not going to convert B12 to the right thing. They can get very tired. Um, a lot of people really can benefit, though. So it's, it's hard to say exactly who wouldn't benefit uh, from it. That's a really good discussion to have with your dietitian at your facility. Um, is this going to be right for me? Or if you want to do it, asking, you know, to have her help you implement it smartly and then watching your labs and your trends. Um, one of the main uh, downsides that I see if there, you know, when there are some is the fatigue factor. And, you know, that often is just very genetically based. So you don't know until you walk down that road unless you do some testing ahead of time. So a couple of nutrients, though, that I think people have to be really, really conscientious of if you're going to implement a plant-based diet. Again, you can eat French fries and chili, and that can be a plant-based meal. Um, so being conscientious of the different nutrients and using a variety is a core, fundamental, extremely important principle when it comes to plant-based diets. So iron. Right? A lot of people who bring up their iron stores by eating, especially in Dallas, it's eating a lot of meat. Meat is a great source of iron. As people move towards a plant-based diet, um, depending on what they're choosing, they can be iron deficient. It's not that a plant-based diet is iron deficient. It's that sometimes how people are incorporating it is that they um, don't get enough iron. So a couple things you can do, um, use a cast iron skillet. There's a product called the Lucky Iron Fish. It's just a little iron fish. You can uh, drop it in your soups or your stews, and it leaches out some iron into it, which can be helpful for you. Uh, cooking from, you know, dried peas, beans, or lentils, uh, even using some dried fruit and dark leafy veggies, some enriched grains can really help boost up your iron. Now, there are some questions about leafy vegetables, and I'll answer those at the end. Um, Sorry, my throat gets a little bit dry. My talk and talk and talk. Uh, B12. This is one that most likely you will need to supplement if you're on a 100% plant-based diet. You can get it some from some from some foods, nutritional yeast, mushrooms, spirulina, fortified cereals. All of those you can get it from, but um, uh, but usually people need to supplement it because the amount you get can be limited without the animal protein. Selenium is one that we really like people to be conscientious of. It's really important for inflammation. Uh, some real interesting studies when it comes to dialysis patients with selenium. The best, best source is Brazil nuts, uh, but including those sunflower seeds, chia seeds, lentils, and grains is really helpful as well to get some selenium in your diet. Omega-3 fatty acids is another one. Um, one of our best sources is fish. And when you're not eating fish, then uh, you're not, you may not get enough. But again, the walnuts, the chia seeds, flax seeds are a really good source, hemp seeds. Uh, pure vegans that don't want to take an actual fish oil supplement, a good quality one, uh, may use an algae supplement. Algae is a good source of omega-3 fatty acids. So, you know, even some of the seafood items can be really helpful. And if you are a gardener, actually, or you like to grow things, or maybe you want a plant that you can eat and include in your salads that takes no care at all, there's a plant called purslane. It actually grows as a weed, but it's very high in omega-3 fatty acids. So just a little tidbit. It often will grow in the cracks of sidewalks. <laughs> Um, so some people think it's a weed, but it's very nutrient dense, super easy to grow. Um, we have a plant in my front yard and it grows really pretty pink and yellow. And you feel like you've done everything, you can't figure out why you always get them. You could very well have a magnesium deficiency. Uh, there tends to be a lot of fear of magnesium in the dialysis world. It can become excessive with too much supplementation. But, you know, overall as a population, we tend to be magnesium deficient. Um, and a plant-based diet, if you're not careful, you may not get enough magnesium. So, again, you're going to see the seeds come up here, sunflower seeds and flax seeds and cashews and pumpkin seeds and pepitas. 
Uh, so conscientiously including those in your diet, sprinkling some on a salad. Some people even put them, you know, the nuts or seeds in a smoothie or they'll grind them up and use them as uh, uh, part of a muffin that they make. Those, all those things are, can be helpful strategies to get this. For calcium, this is the other big one. Uh, some people on a calcium-based binder, so they're going to get some from there. Otherwise, you can get it from dark green veggies, broccoli, tofu, sesame seeds are a really good source. We'll often, you know, sprinkle them on our foods, tahini, fortified cereals, and even some of the fortified milks can also have calcium in them. Some of the fortification of the yogurts and milks, it's a calcium phosphate fortification, so you get phosphorus with it too, which is kind of a, a bummer, but sometimes you can get just a really good uh, calcium fortified food. Um, so some nutrients that we think are very important, what that means, and again, I love to go from a food first perspective, is that you consciously include uh, sunflower seeds or flax seeds or chia seeds or broccoli or tofu or sesame in your daily diet so that you can avoid any deficiencies in these areas. Um, some people benefit from taking a broad spectrum multivitamin as well. Um, and that can be very, very helpful. Okay, let's talk about, we have a couple more things. Let's talk about protein first, right? This is the other thing people say, oh, I'm going to plant this diet. You can't get enough protein. Uh, my albumin is low, and they tell me I have to eat 100,000 eggs and a whole chicken every day to bring it up, which, of course, uh, hopefully your providers know at this point that your albumin is not reflective necessarily of how much protein you eat. It is more reflective of inflammation. That being said, people that are on dialysis do have a slightly higher protein need than people in the regular population. And so including protein throughout your days is important. Um, I really like to use a protein powder. I listed a few ones on here that are really good. Um, some people don't like the taste of some of the protein powders. So I think you just have to kind of Test it out and, and see which ones kind of work for you. If you want to include that in a smoothie in the morning, um, all of that can be, you know, really, really helpful. One thing that I'll have people do if they're trying to test out protein supplements is go to a, like, a health food store and they'll have little packets. And so instead of buying a whole $20 or $30, you know, thing of protein powder only to find out that you don't really like it, <laughs> is that go buy several individual packets for a dollar, dollar fifty or so, and then test out a whole bunch until you find one that you really like that works for you, and that's what you could use. And you can use those protein powders in smoothies, like I said. You can put them in muffins. Um, sometimes people will mix them in their oatmeal. A lot of different ways that you can use this if you need to do a protein boost or, you know, you feel like you're not getting enough there. Um, or if your dietitian is looking at what you're doing, um, that can be really helpful. So last part here, how can you implement this? If you look through this, you're like, whoa, this seems like a lot, I'm a little bit overwhelmed. How would you implement this? And honestly, your best advocate here would be to work with a dietitian. You and her would work out a little plan um, that includes your lab draws so you can test. You know, if you're worried, whoa, is my potassium going to go up too high? Um, is my phosphorus going to go up too high? You can get your labs drawn and see if it actually impacts you as you move towards a plant-based diet. So you, you map out a plan. We teach dietitians courses on how they can implement this. We actually have a guide uh, that we use with dietitians on how to implement this in dialysis. Another thing that's really helpful is to get a really clear list of foods you can eat. Um, that, more than anything, is is huge for people. Get a really clear list of foods you can eat so that you can, number one, stock your pantry that way, and number two, see how vast and expansive your choices are. Um, always when we focus on what we take out, it can be overwhelming. Um, as part of that list, I think a, a really good, honest discussion with your dietitian about how much you need to be restricting potassium would be wise. I think it would be really prudent because you may find you can include some high potassium foods that you previously were limiting, and that makes it a lot easier when you're implementing a plant-based diet. Um, another thing is you log your food. 
I really like using chronometer, uh, C-R-O-N-O-M-E-T-E-R, chronometer.com, and have your dietitian review it with you and look where there might be some holes in your diet. Once you do that for two to three weeks, you usually can figure out what you need to put in um, to include your uh, to include any nutrients that you might be missing. And it can be simple. Sometimes it's as much as just adding two tablespoons of sunflower seeds or whatever to boost up your calories and boost up your um, some of your nutrients. The other thing is to watch for signs of anemia or fatigue. This is probably one of the most common uh, problems that we see when people are newly implementing this or maybe, you know, four, six months down the road, they're like, whoa, I'm just so tired all the time. Um, it can really creep up on you, and it's not just iron. It can be a lot of different nutrients that can be involved with that. So you'd watch for that and make sure that you're being proactive with a multivitamin or, again, with some of those functional foods um, and functional kitchen strategies like using the cast iron skillet. Um, and then I think a good multivitamin, whether or not you're on a plant-based diet, is really helpful for a lot of people just to avoid those long-term nutrient deficiencies. Okay, so uh, at this point, I'd love to accept a few questions from the audience. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and answer some of the ones I see in the chat already, and then if you have other questions, uh, please drop them in the chat, and I'm happy to answer this with you. So one of the questions was, what about leafy vegetables? Um, leafy vegetables are something we include. You, you can include them on a plant-based diet. If you're on a medication and you've been told to restrict them, then you would need to talk with your dietitian and your physician about how you can include them. Oftentimes, um, they're restricted because of vitamin K content. And once you just talk about adding them in, the medication that you're on can be adjusted with the extra you know, vitamin K that you might be getting in your diet from leafy vegetables. I love including them, kale and collards and um, all the different kinds of lettuces really, really is a nice addition. Um, how much B12 supplement to take? Uh, that depends on the person. So that would be a good question to talk with a dietitian at your unit about. Most people can get enough if they take a regular plant or a regular uh, B complex a good quality one, but again, I feel like that's a, a good personalized recommendation to have with your dietitian based on your lab. Um, almond milk, are there any phosphorus concerns here with any of the milks? Almond milks, oat milks, cashew milks, any of the alternative milks, all of them you need to look at the labels to see if they have phosphate additives in the ingredients for all of them, really any packaged food that you haven't made on your own at home, you're going to check into that part. But there's plenty of almond milks that don't have phosphate additives. I think a Blue Diamond is one of them that's you know, used all over the place and doesn't have them. I've seen more and more that the less of them are having phosphate additives, but it's always good to check. Um, how much protein do grains provide? That's a good question. It depends on the grain. Uh, some grains have a lot of protein. Some grains have a little bit of protein. Uh, grains and the nuts and beans are, you know, all, you always combine them together to get a full nutrient profile. So, you know, it just depends, which is why we really encourage our patients to use a variety of grains. Um, don't just use rice. White rice is actually very low in protein. Um, but... Uh, you know, use a, a variety of grain. Try some of the alternative grains that are out there, millet and camelot and test. Um, kind of fun to try some of those those grains. And the Internet is your cookbook. Anything you want to try, you, of course, can uh, Google how do I cook millet. And you can have a video and you can have a tutorial so that you know how to do that. Um, Examples of grains with high protein. Taff is a good example of that. Uh, but even wheat actually has quite a bit of, of protein in it. Um, so I don't have a list right in front of me on the different protein content. So just off the top of my head, I know Taff is pretty high and, um, and uh, wheat can be pretty high. I could probably Google search it real quick and, and get a list, but there's a lot of grains that have, you know, a good amount of protein in it. The only thing I would say there 
is that you don't want to focus your protein intake entirely on grains, right? You include grains and starches in your diet because uh, they're nourishing, they help feed your microbiome. But if you focus there and you don't include the nuts and seeds, and even the vegetables have protein in them too, if you don't include some of those things, you really miss out on other nutrients that are combined with some of those um, some of those grains. Um, okay. And I think uh, Elizabeth, you just noted if some of this information will be shared with with you. And yeah, I think the slides are going to be shared publicly afterwards. So. Other questions that anybody has that I can answer for you? Hi, Jess, this is, this is Kathy. Um, you've mentioned yeah. a couple of times about good quality multivitamins. Do you have some suggestions on how, how to find one or what makes one vitamin group high quality versus another one? Ah, that's a, that's a really good question. <laughs> it's actually a, a pretty long question. There's a few, you know, uh, there are some brands that are reputable. They have third-party testing. I don't find that all of the grocery store brands are very reputable. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a, that honestly is almost a whole other presentation for another <laughs> another day <laughs> and the okay. thing is some of the the very reputable brands they can have really high levels of some like they have they're kind of mega vitamins they have a lot of nutrients in them and so i don't want to say that there's one vitamin in particular that is helpful uh if your dietitian has recommended a particular renal vitamin for you i find that they tend to have you know they're good fill in the gap sort of vitamins um but i take a, a you know take another look at it and make sure that it has enough b12 in it or has b12 in it period um uh, that that would be something that i would be looking at and then the b vitamins as a whole sometimes you need to to uh to bump that bump up the amount or i you know there's several brands that i like and i hate to give a shout out just to one or one or two brands there can be a lot that are really good but again it's uh some of them have mega doses of some vitamins in them and that you'd want to review with one of your with your dietitian so okay uh, looks like there's a couple of more questions on that yeah just uh, a couple more questions how many potatoes or onions can one eat i think that really depends on the person uh overall variety is always encouraged um so, it, you know, uh, that question is just really, really dependent on the person. I don't generally have limitations on onions and potatoes. I, I feel like it can be hard to overdo them if you're using whole food sources. But, again, it just depends on the person. Some people do need to be careful or, you know, uh, take out some of the potassium in them, double boil them. Um, processed food has potassium sorbate which limits their consumption. I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question, Millen. Maybe if you can retype that in there. Is there a handout or download of this information? I think the slides are going to be released publicly, so you'd be able to utilize that. Otherwise, um, if you have a dietitian yeah. that wants to learn yeah. about this and work with you, we train and have resources for them at kinyard.com, or else we have also a uh, meal plan as well, which can be helpful. So just a, a couple thoughts there. Um, other questions that people might have, I'd love to answer them. Well, it looks like you've given everybody a bit to think about, um, and we will Good. post this slide, <laughs> as well as the presentation, mm -hmm. because there's a a lot that you shared that um, I, I think will, a lot of it will need a, a second time around. So um, thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing all of that information. I think it is a topic that's of interest to a lot of people. So um, much appreciated, Jess.
Um, You're welcome. I, Thank you for letting me be here today. Uh, we're, we're happy to have you, and I still don't see any other questions. So I, we will close at this point. Um, I encourage everyone to complete the feedback form. Uh, please join us next month for our webinar um, on July 22nd. It will be at 2 p.m. Eastern time, and it's going to talk about how healing works get well and stay well using your hidden power to heal uh, with Dr. Wayne Jonas. So we hope you join us next month as well. And everyone have a good rest of the week. And thank you for sharing the hour with us. Thank you, everyone.